So I always like to include this, this tutorial with the class. Um, and I do this for anatomy and phys both. And I call it my four circle heart tutorial. And so essentially what I'm doing is taking the complexity of the heart, stripping it down, super simple, and then adding layers. And as I add the layers of information, I'm giving you um, strict rules to follow to kind of help you understand the heart and remember the way things flow through, <clears throat> but also how the flow is regulated. So it starts off easy, right? The left side of our image is the right side of the heart, and the right side of the image is the left side of the heart. And just a reminder that we're always using anatomical right and anatomical left, and so you're looking at a patient's right side, left side. So again, you're assuming you're face to face with the individual. So you're looking at the anterior surface and that's why the sides are flipped. If you're looking at the posterior side of a person, then obviously we would match up. So anterior view here. So I have rules for you here. Straightforward, right side of the heart deals only with lower oxygen blood. The left side of the heart deals with higher oxygen blood. The two aren't going to mix, except. And the except is before birth. In the fetal heart, we know um, from what we've learned already that there is a hole here, the foramen ovale. So that foramen will allow deoxygenated blood to cross if and only if it remains patent functional after birth. So the hole here in the fetus is really important because it allows the fetal circulatory system to bypass the right ventricle and therefore bypass the lungs, right? Because the blood that's coming into the right atrium in the fetus is already oxygenated from the mom. But you can follow that rule, blood doesn't cross. And again, I always throw in the exception there with the fetus because we are going to learn or already have learned about that depending on what course you're in right now and where you are in the course. So again, not to be confused with fetal. So the other rule I have for you is that the atria always receive blood. And what I mean by that is it's receiving blood from the outside. So both right atrium and left atrium are receiving external blood. So the right atrium's receiving it from all the systemic tissue, right? So you're talking through the um, superior and inferior vena cava, but it's also gonna receive blood from the coronary sinus, which is part of our coronary blood system for the heart. So that'll, that'll be the blood draining the heart tissue itself. The left atrium we know is gonna receive blood, and it's gonna receive blood from the pulmonary circula circulatory system. So the left atrium is receiving it from the pulmonary veins. Again, right atrium is receiving systemic blood, which is gonna be deoxy blood. Left atrium's receiving blood from the pulmonary system, which will be higher oxygen blood. Next, we have that the ventricles always send. And again, I'm talking about sending outside of the heart. So we know that the right ventricle is sending to the lungs, the left ventricle is sending to um, the systemic tissue. So again, just quickly, systemic blood is draining into the right atrium because atria always receive, and logically, if blood coming from systemic tissues, which again is all of our tissues other than the lungs, all of that blood is gonna be lower oxygen blood because it would have just given off its oxygen to the tissue. So again, we know that we have lower oxygen blood coming into the heart. So we break that into two pieces. The lower oxygen blood can only go to the right side of the heart because of rule number one. And if it's going into the heart from outside, it has to be in a, a chamber that's receiving blood. Therefore, it has to be an atrium. So logically, systemic blood, because it's lower oxygen, has to be on the right side, and because it's coming into the heart, has to be the atrium. So again, rather than memorizing this, try to understand it. We also know that if we have lower oxygen blood in the ventricle, 
we know that the, the role of the ventricles to send blood outside. And if we have lower oxygen blood, we don't want to send that to our tissues. We want to send it to the lungs to pick up oxygen. So again, makes sense. It has to go to the pulmonary system. If we go to left for a minute, again, we have oxygenated blood, right? Our higher oxygen blood returning to the heart from the pulmonary veins. And when it does that, we know it has to come to a part of the heart that's prepared to receive blood from outside. So we know that has to be the atrium. So again, logically, we have high oxygen blood. It has to be left side. It's, the heart is receiving it from outside. It has to be the atrium. Therefore, the only place in the heart that blood from the lungs can go to is the left atrium. Last but not least, our big guy, the left ventricle. Again, we know it's left, high oxygen blood. We know that it's sending because it's a ventricle. And we know that logically, the only place we want to send high oxygen blood is, is our systemic tissues. Because we're not going to take high oxygen blood and send it back to the lungs, right? That's redundant. So we'll send it to our systemic tissues. The tissues will then take out the oxygen, give off CO2, and then it'll return to the heart through the right atrium. So all of that is pretty simple. And again, something you probably learned in high school um, and in anatomy, phys, patho, again, whatever course you're taking. But we have to also talk about the control of flow. So I'm including the valves here. So we have two different kinds of valves. We have our AV valves, or our atrioventricular valves. And notice the word there, atrioventricular. It's literally atrium ventricle. So it makes sense that these AV valves are between the atria and the ventricles. So we have our right AV valve, our tricuspid, and we have our left AV valve, our bicuspid. And I know in class you would have seen that the right AV valve is called a tricuspid because it has three parts to it, and the left AV valve is bicuspid because it has two. Again, the left AV valve has another name, and that's mitral, so don't let that throw you off. So I always say my rule for the AV valves is that they control the flow within the heart. Again, because they're controlling the flow between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So, the AV valve is open during ventricular diastole, right? And if you've done that part, great. If you haven't, you can ignore that. But again, when the ventricle's relaxed, this is open, allowing blood to flow from the atrium to the ventricle. And the same happens on both sides, because these are both AV valves. They're going to have the same function. When the ventricles start to contract and the pressure starts to build up, this needs to close. It needs to close because if it doesn't, we have blood backing up into the atrium. And that just decreases the efficiency of the whole heart. So it doesn't make any sense. So therefore, we stick this valve in the middle. The valve doesn't allow for backflow as long as it's functioning properly. Um, instead, this valve is a one-way valve and allows blood from atrium to ventricle, but not backwards. So this valve closing allows for a buildup of pressure in the ventricle, which will help us open the other valve and eject blood from the heart. So again, our AV valves are always ever between the atrium and the ventricle, one-way flow, and preventing backflow of blood from the ventricle to the atrium. We also know we have a second set of valves, and these are our semilunars. So our semilunar valves are between the ventricles and the great vessels, namely your pulmonary trunk for the right side and your aorta for the left. So if we throw them in here, you can see now they're labeled the pulmonary valve, sometimes the pulmonary semilunar valve, and the aortic valve or the aortic semilunar valve. 
I always talk about these semilunar valves as controlling the flow from the heart to the outside. So again, the AV valves are controlling flow within the heart. Our semilunar valves are controlling flow from ventricles to the outside. Again, these are one-way valves. So our semilunar valves, once they open, allow blood to flow out of the ventricle and into that blood vessel. But once that pressure decreases, so once the ventricle starts to relax, that valve closes and it will not allow backflow of blood. So it will not allow the blood to slide back down and into the heart. Again, that's if it's working properly. And in patho, um, we'll talk about what happens when you have either stenotic valves that don't open all the way or regurgitant valves when they don't close properly. But again, you should be able to follow this flow all the way through um, and you should be able to add in the major vessels. So we'll go through it quickly, we'll add the vessels, and then I'll mention the uh, cardiac conduction system quickly too. So, from the systemic uh, system into the right atrium, again, our two big feeds are going to be our superior and inferior vena cava, but we'll also have the coronary sinus, which is draining the heart tissue. Again, blood's going to flow in to the right atrium, go through that right AV or tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. We know ventricles are going to send, so it's going to send it through the pulmonary semilunar valve to the pulmonary trunk, to the pulmonary arteries, and carry it away. Reminder, it's always arteries when they're leaving the heart, right, and heading to the tissue, regardless of the content of the blood. So even lower oxygen blood, as long as the vessel is carrying it away from the heart, it's still an artery. Uh, and as long as the blood is returning to the heart, it's always going to be a vein, even if it is higher oxygen blood. So again, we have a lower oxygen blood being carried in that pulmonary trunk. It'll go to the lungs and return to the heart through the pulmonary veins. So again, the pulmonary veins are going to be the main um, delivery mechanism for blood to the left atrium. From the left atrium, there we go, left atrium, it'll go through the left AV or bicuspid or mitral valve. It's lovely that they give it three names. Um, in the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, we know we have high oxygen blood. It's now being sent out of the heart. Logically, it should go to our systemic tissues, and it'll do that through the aorta. But first, it has to open the aortic semilunar valve and then go to the, to the system. Again, major vessel here will be our uh, ascending and then arch of the aorta and then descending aorta and all the different branches. So that's the basics. Um, but I do want to mention the cardiac conduction system here because I know in each of the courses this is something we talk about. So again, with your cardiac conduction system, that's the kind of intrinsic nervous system of the heart. So you're talking about the SA node, the AV node, and all the associated structures. So your SA node is housed up here in the right atrium. And so the SA node is our pacemaker, so it's going to set the, the heart rate. And it's going to control the depolarization and contraction of the atria. So again, SA node has two functions, pacemaker and atrial contraction. So the SA node is a pacemaker because it controls the rate of depolarization for the AV node. So the AV node is housed down here, kind of in between the two atria. And so it's going to control the contraction of the ventricles. So again, it has nervous structures associated with it, which will carry that depolarizing um, signal down and into the ventricles and cause ventricular contraction. So where the SA node is pacemaker and atrial contraction, the AV node is ventricular contraction. And the AV node has other structures associated with it, um, but you'll, you'll see that when you hit that part of the lecture. 
But really with that, it's the end of the four circle heart tutorial. Um, hopefully you find it useful. My students usually do. Uh, and that's it. As always, you know where to find me.